Welcome back to episode three of the Works Plus Grinder series. Joshy, what have we talked about so far? Brando, in episode two, we introduced the machine you're sitting on right now, the King Concepts Dual Drive PG820. First of the dual drive, first machine that's really been designed for dry grinding, really harsh environments, and uh, much bigger horsepower than was previously seen. This machine would stay in this particular configuration for a number of years before King Concepts was purchased by Husqvarna Group. Now appearing in the Husqvarna Group catalog, the machines were in orange, and that would remain the only major update to those machines for a number of years before coming out again with a new iteration. Brando, what was the new iteration? We'd include these bad boys here, remote control. So sure. Josh, what did this bad boy do for the grinding industry? Good question, Brando. Let's go and have a look. At a glance, the machine doesn't look physically very different. There's a few minor changes, but if we get a bit of a closer look, we'll see that there's a, uh, a radio transmitter receiver box on top. At least I believe that's what it is. And we've got some noticeably different wheels and some minor changes to the chassis itself. The angles on the chassis are the same, the way that the box mounts up is the same. But one thing that you can't tell from the outside, Brando, is that these tubes here are actually filled with solid steel to give it additional weight for the wheels to make traction. Now, this is an, both an advantage and a disadvantage. Obviously, we're getting better traction on the wheels, which is required. For a machine that's same direction rotation, you need a lot more grip to keep it going straight. So the weight was required. The weight, however, happens to be partially behind the wheels, yeah. which means that we're actually losing down pressure on the discs. So while the machine's gained a few pounds, it hasn't gained any extra. In fact, it's actually lost a bit of weight on the head itself. So as the grinding game is all about power to weight, we actually lose a bit there. Joshy, I'm a fan of history as much as the next person, but what does it actually translate to for the operator? I'm glad you asked. Well, basically what it does is it really takes, in my opinion, it really takes the grinding and polishing industry from being an art form to being something that is transferable from a skill perspective. Previously, an operator would stand behind the machine and they would be looking at what's coming out and they'd be like in this groove going, oh yeah, that's about right. That's that's my speed, mm. right? Now, if I said, Brandon, I'm, I'm done for the day, it's your turn. It's very, very difficult for me to say to you, that's around about the speed I was traveling at and you actually being able to transfer exactly the same. This is, this is problematic when we're creating a finished product. Mm. Come along, radio control, now we can actually dial in those speeds and I could say, I could hand over the radio control to you, which I should have in my hand when I'm talking to you. I could hand over the radio control to you and say, just maintain those numbers and it's gonna sail along at the same profile behind the machine, the same scratch removal speed. All the processes are now done at the same speed as you would expect in a manufacturing facility. Sure. Just for a moment, Imagine a manufacturing facility and how they work. They have a conveyor belt with the grinding heads, the material comes in and travels across that conveyor belt. It doesn't have an operator turning the crank by hand. Right. And for very good reason, right? But that's what we've effectively been doing up until we get to the point of radio controlled grinders. And we always tell our contractors that they're mobile manufacturers. This is true. So what we've done going into radio control is we've made it a lot more scalable from a business perspective. Um, we've made it, we've put some tangibles in there as far as metrics is concerned. We know with a lot more accuracy how long it's going to take to produce a particular type of product on site. And we've reduced operator fatigue. Um, they were also very, very good for getting machines on and off of site. Previously, contractors have required tailgate loader or ramps with a winch and all types of equipment to get them on site. But the radio control mechanisms on these machines were really, really strong and allowed the operators to just drive them straight onto site with a set of ramps and so, and so forth. So a really, really good advancement for operator fatigue 
um, OHS, obviously improvements, and of course, just that consistency of product. Oh, Joshua, well, this sounds super exciting to me, being able to dial it in and pass on the uh, remote to the next person. Um, I don't think I'll see anything wrong with it. Well, so you shouldn't, but there were actually some issues with the design on this machine. It was surprising that for a machine that was had a history of being so robust, had a drive mechanism on it, which wasn't quite as robust as the rest of the machine. And early, early adopters of the, of the technology soon found out that uh, the, the wheel shafts were breaking or flogging out. And the, also the, the mechanism for mounting the motors uh, would fail pretty soon afterwards. So we spent a lot of time building um, aftermarket kits to upgrade and, um, and reinforce and bolster all of that mechanism so you got much, much smoother running mm. and, um, and also got uh, a lot more reliability out of it. Now, one of the things as far as the smoother running was concerned was actually very important to us. And that was that we had a real continuous feed on the wheels, which is good, particularly if you're going from having a, a human propelled grinder, which is not necessarily a real consistent feed on the wheel, and now we have the capacity to go to a very consistent feed, everything needs to be pretty tight. Mm. So any type of slop or movement in the drivetrain is then gonna transfer back into the head. So we'd end up with a machine that goes forward and backward and doesn't leave a really clear and um, consistent profile on the floor. And having a machine that does that, kind of, we lose the advantage of having that radio control and having that consistency of, of grinding pattern. So we had to make some improvements to get it to that point where we could have a really consistent feed, no slop, no backlash, and of course no failures in the motors because they're very expensive to replace. Once we got to that point, the machines were an absolute dream and um, very consistent feed on the wheels and then we're getting a very, very nice and even scratch profile. And now we've really removed that whole human element from, from the, uh, the manufacturing process. Hmm. Lovely, all right, well, how do we dial this in, turn this into dollars for the customers? Yeah, well, once you've got it to that point, um, you can run the machine for longer hours if, you're, uh, you know, if you need to or if you have the capacity to, but there's always, there's always a ceiling with anything. So now that we've got the wheels doing what they need to do, got the, uh, the machine operating in a straight line, the next thing is like, okay, now we've got the machine running eight hours a day, we had the old machine running at eight hours a day with the same horsepower, where's the advantage coming from? Obviously, when we want to move machinery around site, dust extractors and, and obstructions out of the way, the machine can keep driving, which is great. And when we're grouting the floor or spraying down densifier in front of the machine, obviously the machine is autonomous at that point. Yeah. And so we're, the operator is able to do other activities that contribute slightly to increased productivity but that's not where it got really exciting. So where did it get exciting, Josh? It got exciting when these machines actually got big blocked. Ooh, it sounds exciting to me. So basically what we did is we took the existing infrastructure, and we made some changes to the head, mm -hmm. and we grabbed a 15 kilowatt motor and put that in place instead. Do you want to see what it does? Absolutely, let's run it. Brandon, got a big block sitting right here. What I want to do now is take this 15 kilowatt bad boy and I actually want to take the chassis off, put the radio control onto here. Then we're going to have to reprogram her to give her a tickle up inside so that we can actually get all of those 15 kilowatts out of the drives. And then we'll do a shakedown test and see what that big block does. Hell yeah. Let's do it. I knew he'd say that. As with the previous tests, we'll be running the same tooling just to keep things consistent.
just as we did in episode one and episode two, we're gonna give the big block a 15 minute power run and see what she can do. After we've uh, done that, we're gonna suck up all the dust and measure how much we've produced and see how the numbers stack up. Brando, will you do the honors? Let's do it. And then very nice work on the grinding there, mate. Really appreciate it. Also, you'd need some serious guns to lift those bags and um, well, I couldn't have done that without you. Thanks, Joshy. Appreciate the uh, little plug there, mate. Must, you wouldn't have been able to feel the difference between the machines because you weren't pushing it. But um, hey, what a surprise. An extra three kilowatts of power and an extra 40 kilograms of weight from that big motor upgrade and we're getting really big numbers. So we've gone from just over 35 kilograms with a standard 820 King Concepts to a big block radio control, and we're getting big numbers now. What do we got? What are the results? Well, Joshy, we always operate with flare. So we've got 65.1 kilos in dust here combined, and we're looking at an over 30% increase uh, with the big block on the RC chassis. That's not bad for a retired PE teacher. Not bad at all. If you ever want to know numbers, he's a man to go to. Which brings us to the end of episode number three. If you want to know what else is in store, have we tapped out? Is there more in this? You'll have to tune in in episode four. Right. Brandon, hey, we're trying to make a video over here about grinders. See you guys all on episode number four.